hello and welcome uh, everyone out there who may be uh, attending our town hall shaping the future science me to you and we're looking at the uh, and we're looking at the climate emergency and our topic is our greenhouse gas legacy today for the town hall big questions can we avoid a 1.5 degree c to 2 degree c future for the sake of our children and all future generations and can government stop pushing and funding fossil fuels or can we uh, persuade them to stop that I'm Peter Carter, I'm Director of the Climate Emergency Institute. I have more detailed uh, background posted on the Climate Emergency Institute website. This is a great recent speech by our UN Director General, Antonio Guterres, in which he denounces the suicidal failure to act on climate change. He was responding to state of the global climate report by the WMO. Headline, warmer world in 2020 busted weather records, and the WMO said that we were headed for a 1.2 degree C warming this year. So this is that uh, WM, from that WMO report, December state of the global climate, in which the report refers to the acceleration of global warming, and indeed in 2018, the same WMO report was actually entitled Acceleration of Climate Change Impacts. In 2018, the Secretary General made a profound and true statement that the world is facing a direct existential threat and must rapidly shift from dependence on fossil fuels by 2020 to prevent runaway climate change. So what are the existential threats? The problem, of course, is atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution, and there are several such threats. There are multiple adverse climate change impacts on agriculture and world agriculture, and they increase as the temperature increases. We have, and we have caused, the ongoing sixth mass extinction, which is accelerating, recent paper, and climate change will boost that acceleration even further. Oceans, this is ocean planet. The threat of marine ecosystem collapse from heating and acidification and deoxygenation, and they all make each other worse. Runaway climate change that the Secretary General referred to. This is the uh, deadly effect from multiple inter-reinforcing enormous feedback sources which amplify as they're triggered and increase again with surface warming amplify that surface warming this is the most important statement ever this was made by the ipcc chair dr hassan lee last year at the opening of the climate conference UN climate conference in madrid uh his statements quote our assessment shows that Greenhouse gas emissions must start to peak from next year. And the three special reports reconfirm the urgent need for immediate reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And he repeated in his speech the imperative of immediate global reduction. This is from the first of those three special reports, the IPCC 1.5C report. And this shows what we've all heard about that. Uh, for our survival scenario, we must get global emissions to drop at least 50% from now to 2030. And we can readily do that, except governments are preventing it. Uh, very interestingly, this survival scenario by 2050 showed a virtual elimination of fossil fuel energy. And that's quite right, of course. But, as I say, we're being pushed in the opposite direction. The world economy has the world on the worst case climate change scenario. A paper this year on cumulative CO2 emissions following the worst case. That graph is cumulative CO2 emissions from uh, 1700 up to uh, this year, 2020. And that's from Scripps, the Scripps Institute. Another big but climate negotiations are going nowhere. They were deadlocked at the 2019 COP25, 
there's no negotiation that's going on now, and there's been no action or progress since the 2015 Paris Agreement. The very latest, when I checked yesterday, only three parties, that's only three countries, have submitted their second supposedly and promised to be improved NBC. That's their national emissions targets. So no single large emitter has strengthened its national emissions target since Paris. We're still left with paltry climate catastrophe targets. And another big and present but. The post-COVID post economic recovery plans. These plans are fatal for the future of humanity and life on Earth because the lion's share has gone to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels 53%, clean energy 35%. That's a report from Energy Policy Tracking. This shows that, and this is from the International Energy Agency, the agency mandated to keep the oil flowing around the world so nobody could be more credible. And uh, this is their energy outlook, world energy outlook this year. This is fossil fuel emissions, a billion tons of CO2. You can see the big record decline with COVID. And you see here the plans that are already being put in place by world governments to put the emissions right back up to where they were and to keep them increasing. No decrease until 2030 and further. It's very good that the IEA put a net zero 2050 scenario in here, a rapid decline in fossil fuel CO2 emissions. And by 2030, they have fossil fuel emissions declining 73%. Our governments are not listening. They're not listening to our scientists, and they're not listening to these international organizations. This is the very latest such study, 2nd of December. This is from UNEP, IISD, and a couple of other organizations. This is called the production gap. This looks at a billion tons of CO2 per year again in terms of the gap between what we have to do, survival scenario now, and what governments are doing, and the same thing only looks worse from IEA. They are, there's that big drop, they are pushing emissions right back up and keeping them increasing, well, while we have to, as all the scientists know and agree, we have to aim for one degree, for 1.5 degrees C, and to do that, we have to decline rapidly from this year, sustain this decline. This applies also to 2 degrees C by 2100, though that is total catastrophe. Um, as if it wasn't bad enough, the world governments have actually increased their fossil fuel subsidies. And that really, really is the crime of all time. We're looking now then at 2 degrees C catastrophic impacts. We're on track for 2 degrees C by 2045. This that I'm showing is one single of the IPCC so-called burning embers reasons for concern. This is how the IPCC now expresses and illustrates impacts and their risks with this burning ember gradation, one degree, 1.5 degree, and two degrees C. I'm showing this one, this most important one from extreme weather events from the IPCC 1.5 degree C report. This, then, is the most damaging climate change effect on population and on crops, extreme weather events, and as we all know, they're increasing. This actually is also additional impacts and risks on top of ongoing natural extreme weather events in this case. Uh, this is just to show how many uh, of the reasons for concern with particular issues and aspects the IPCC has now covered. I took the 16 from the three recent reports, 1.5 degrees C, oceans and cryosphere, and the most recent one, land. And you can see I have put the 2 degrees C, a black line, along the 2 degrees C, and you can see all in the red, the red being widespread and severe impacts, risks. And if you look down 1.5 degrees C, that also looks terrible. And 1.5 degrees C itself is disastrous. 
These are the numbers, uh, the terrible numbers from that same IPCC report. At 2 degrees C, 2 billion people will be suffering water scarcity. The tropical, the tropical coral reefs will be dead, 99% bleached, 97% bleached at 1.5 degrees C. Food, 1.3 billion people, billion people will be undernourished. Heat waves will be affecting, severe heat waves will be affecting 6 billion more people. Malaria will increase. There will be 685,000 malaria deaths per year. Dengue will also increase as well, no treatment for that. Extreme poverty will increase to several hundred million more people. A terrible, terrible legacy. And now on to um, what, is, uh, what is happening, what we are seeing in real time, the deadly accelerating data sets of Earth systems which together are trending rapidly to biosphere collapse. This is the all-important atmospheric CO2. It's from NOAA, NOAA, the National Ocean and, and Atmospheric Administration in the States. This graph from this record from 1958 right up to the present time of November this year, you see it's accelerating all the way, and it has now reached up to 414.72 parts per million, and it's still accelerating. This is just showing that recent, uh, same trace, only the seasonally adjusted mean trace, so it's clearer, and just from 2010, and see the acceleration. Now, in the past 12 months, CO2 has increased 2.76 ppm parts per million of air. Over the average for this decade, it's 2.44 ppm. The decade before was 1.9, and the decade before that, 1.5 ppm. CO2 accelerated. If you look at the bottom of the graph here, you'll see 300 ppm. 300 ppm is the limit of the one million year ice core. We have such ice cores now, and so, our industrialized civilization has put, and this is absolutely incredibly bad, has pushed atmospheric CO2 38% higher than its one million year limit. And that, from research this year, is the highest in 23 million years. That is crazy. And it is increasing at a rate with no known precedent in the past 40 million years. WMO 2017, crazy on crazy. And what a legacy. As well as atmospheric CO2, the other two main greenhouse gases, they're also at record highs and accelerating. On the left, there's methane. On the right, the pale blue. On the right, there's nitrous oxide on the pale brown. The, the upper two of them they're just very recent data sets. Look how methane is accelerating just in the past few years. Um, all of the scientists are uh, more than perturbed about that one. On the bottom, the longer data sets, 1984 from methane and 2000 from nitrous oxide. Um, you're looking at a terrible, terrible situation for our future. This is atmospheric CO2 equivalent that rolls in all the atmospheric greenhouse gases. It's now unbelievably over 500 ppm because last year NOAA in their very useful annual greenhouse gas index put it at 500 ppm. So you see the CO2 equivalent on the, back, on the, on the black line there and it is actually accelerating also in the past, past few years and it's uh, it's skyrocketing. And, and 500 ppm, of course, we know it is way above 2 degrees C on equilibrium global warming. This is global surface warming, global temperature increase from 1860 up to uh, present time, up to 2020. There are two lines there. You see the red line is the actual global temperature increase as recorded. And under it, there is an orange line, which is very useful. This is provided by the Oxford University's 
Global Warming Index, and their index in August was 1.61 degrees C. That's the index, and that is how they can do that, is they take all the external extraneous influences on the global climate out, so they leave us with just what our industrial greenhouse gas emissions are doing, and just look how that acceleration picks up over the past decade. WMO says, as I've said, that we are going to be at 1.2 degrees C uh, this year, 2020. So there's, this, there's that same record, but this is projected with models up to 2050. This from the IPCC 1.5 degrees C report. So you see these models are soaring up on the same accelerating uh, trajectory. So we'll be at 1.5 degrees C by 2035, and unless something very powerful and very effective happens, we will be at 2 degrees C by 2045. The biggest, worst news this year was that the Northern Hemisphere summer was the hottest <coughs> summer ever on record. You see, and, and thanks to NOAA for alerting us with a big press release on that. This uh, graph, this record is from NASA GISS. That, you see, is the Northern Hemisphere summer. And the temperature is soaring up. You can see that, again, for the past 10 years, it's, there's an increase in the acceleration. I got it, this summer was, I got it to 1.36 from NASA. The uh, NOA told me it was even higher, over 1.4. This is NASA's map. This is NASA's temperature map showing for the Northern Hemisphere uh, from pre-industrial. And uh, you see that the Northern Hemisphere is warming much faster than the Southern Hemisphere. The Arctic warming fastest of all. And just look at Siberia. Siberia had absolutely incredible record heat this year, as you no doubt will remember, and there were fires in the Arctic. Um, Siberia, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere is absolutely crucial because that's where most of the permafrost is. The permafrost is warming, the temperature is increasing, it's thawing, and the permafrost is emitting all three greenhouse gases right now, uh, methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide, the oceans. Now, this, of course, is the ocean planet. As atmospheric CO2 concentration is accelerating, of course, so is ocean acidification. This is ocean acidification, the latest data from the Japan Meteorological Agency. I've inverted the pH to show the relative acidification, how that's increasing on an accelerating trajectory, and the atmospheric CO2 behind it. This is ocean heat. The vast majority of the heat that we've added to the climate system from our greenhouse gas emissions and accelerating atmospheric concentrations most goes to the oceans, 93%. And uh, this is the deeper ocean. This is to 2,000 meters. And um, that's clearly accelerating. Ocean heat causes ocean deoxygenation. So ocean oxygen is declining. That's what this research shows. And it's declining also at an accelerating rate. Everything is getting worse faster. This is the FAO, State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, this year's report. And they document the recent increase in food insecurity attributed to climate shocks and conflict. And in that report, most terrible of all, world hunger is on the rise again. We had been slowly getting world hunger to decline for many years. But now, over the past three years, it's increasing again. And just look at that increase to 2030, projected by the FAO. An absolutely terrible legacy. So we're into food now, and another single of those IPCC reasons for concern, thermometers, 1 degree, 1.5 degree, 2 degree C. This shows food supply instabilities. This was a new reason for concern with the IPCC land report. And we're right into the red. Remember, these are additional impacts, and red is widespread and severe impacts. 
Here we have the IPCC, the orientation that they normally use. 11 separate food insecurity factors, 1 degree C, 1.5, 2 degrees C, uh, the terrible one in the middle, which is the worst of all, that's the warm water coral reefs, extreme weather events to the far left, uh, note third from the left, soil erosion, and that's an additional impact on present soil erosion, and uh, global climate change causes soil erosion, um, downpours, droughts, drying. On the right there, you see one, two, three, four. They are uh, reasons for concern being monitored. These are actual monitored results um, of uh, fish and fisheries. And in the 1.5 degree C report, the outlook for the fisheries for 1.5 C and 2 C is absolutely terrible. This is a map of the world food production of world crops, crop intensity from satellite data. You'll see all the best uh, food production regions are in the northern hemisphere. Now, most importantly for global warming, there is a well-established, long-established crop temperature safety limit of 30 degrees C or 86 degrees F. And there is the quote from the IPCC. Uh, any extreme daytime temperatures throughout the growing season, and you can see these graphs on the bottom the one I bought in black. When the crop reaches its tolerance limit, it really does crash. This is the most important slide of all. This is the latest research on extreme weather events published this year extreme heat hotspots at 2 degrees C. Now, the legend shows that the coloration starts at 30 degrees C and goes higher than 30 degrees C. If you compare where we're growing our food with these regional hotspots, we have a terrible, terrible problem with a terrible legacy with respect to extreme heat on crop yields. This is from the AR5. This is getting into the other aspect of drought, and of course they can occur together. This is soil moisture change at 2.4 degrees C. Again, compare the map of the green crops with the uh, reduction in moisture with the uh, pink and into the red. Very, very worried. This is one single crop. I'm showing here, this is maize yield decline at 2 degrees C of global warming, and you can see decline in all regions at 2 degrees C, and particularly in the United States, it's particularly severe, as well as in South Africa there. To the United States, which after all is the most successful, best food producing country in the world, these are trends, actual trends. This is extreme heat, the maximum temperature, documented, recorded, and compare the crop intensity with the, um, uh, with the extreme heat. And this, these, are temp these are temperature trends we're going to get to uh, projection in a minute. This, again, is trend, a uh, 30-year trend, again, up to 2017. This is precipitation rainfall. Again, compare that to... The crops. The United States is very vulnerable to global warming and climate disruption. And NOAA put out an alert article actually back in 2013 saying that climate change will increase water stress in many parts of the United States by mid century or two degrees. This is a projection of extreme heat for the United States. This shows the number of days increasing with temperatures and the number of days in this case at 90 degrees F above. And a temperature increase of 90 F, which is way higher than the 30 degree C, which is 86 degree F, danger limit for crop yields and temperature. So the days increase as the red deepens compared with the map. I think this is the last slide um, this is a study of 2015. This is entitled Unprecedented 21st Century Drought Risk in the American Southwest and Central Plains. And they did a range of temperature increases, and this one 
is at 2.2 degrees C. So you can see the widespread reduction in soil moisture with the increase in the global surface temperature, most severe in the American Southwest there, but it, it, it spreads right up into where I live in South Coastal British Columbia. So this reduction in soil moisture projected by these models is, uh, is severe. And so let us think about this and have a discussion and leave a legacy worth sharing on climate and oceans. And let's discuss how can scientists do even more to leave the best possible climate and oceans legacy. Thank you very much. So I've just put a, um, a few ideas up here. If we don't have any questions, I can just sort of run through this and um, a moderator technician can interrupt if there are people out there asking questions. Um, so what I thought and what I would love to see is um, I'd love the scientists to start um, pushing um, scientific righteous pressure on governments right now to stop their funding and subsidizing of um, uh, fossil fuel energy and put everything into our future of clean energy because the only future we have is a 100% clean energy future. So I'm hoping that the national science institutions will also declare uh, a climate emergency. Uh, as far as I can see, they actually haven't done so, although the climate emergency is very, very widespread and acknowledged now. Um, uh, and also, the National Academies, I, I think really, because it's in the IPCC assessments, they should call for a stop of uh, governments subsidizing uh, the fossil fuel industry um, and to stop the carbon suicide. Perhaps the scientific community could make, uh, and particularly through the AGU and the EGU, for example, make this climate and oceans emergency, the state of the planet, under accelerating global climate change, the number one science priority. All very well um, uh, thinking on Mars, but we are in a dire emergency back home on Earth, and uh, we need our leaders and leading institutions, and that's the scientists, um, uh, to uh, make some strong intervention at this time. So the um, uh, a, a fairly um, easy thing and sort of obvious thing for the National Academies Royal Societies to do is to support what the IPCC and the IPCC chair said at the Madrid COP, and that is that there must be an immediate, rapid, sustained decline in global emissions. Um, let's have uh, all the scientist organizations saying that it's so well established, it's so clear, and supported by the IPCC. I mean, it couldn't have been made clearer. The last thing is, is an idea which has been around since 2006 that I'm aware of, and that is a massive R&D project. Um, the United States could do it alone, the United States and a couple of other countries, or the whole world hopefully would get together on an all-out Manhattan Marshall model R&D global venture to um, rescue the future, to uh, save planet Earth, and to leave a livable legacy for all today's children in the world and all future generations. Because we know we have the technologies well advanced to rapidly replace all fossil fuel energy with 100% clean renewable energy. The IPC said that in a special report on renewable energy back in 2012, well established now.